and the cottage has fallen into just tenant flats. No one's paying attention to it. And this group of people come together at the tail end of World War II, and they're all coping with loss and trauma in some way, and they decide to form a society to save the cottage. So it's really a story about loving not just Jane Austen, but books and how people can connect with each other over books, but also get comfort from books. And it's about coping with grief and loss and taking those first few steps to re-engage with life and to find even the smallest ways to find hope. Uh, so that's my book. That's, that sounds awesome. Now you may have answered my next question but I'm anyway because I'm curious what your answer will be um you know as I mentioned your book was an instant bestseller you hit several lists USA Today PW uh LA Times uh you were in several uh on the Canadian bestseller list I think you mentioned eight we talked about eight weeks um which is so impressive do you think there's a reason people are gravitating toward this kind of book right now I think that's a really good question um when I wrote this book, I was in a time in my life where my husband had been given one of those difficult medical diagnoses where you're not quite sure what's going on or how much time you have. And he's stable right now, but you know, two or three years ago is very, and I wrote this book in a time of great uncertainty. So I was using the story and my minimal sense of control, as you guys know, as writers, you know, that sense of you've created a world and so once in a while you do get to make a decision. And once in a while you do get to sort of decide, yeah, that's, I'm going to have that happen. And that was the spirit in which then to have the just, you know, literally like a couple months before my book came out, I think that, yes, I think my themes resonate with people, number one, but I also believe that Jane Austen historically has been someone that people have turned to in times of, of, um, so you know, at the end of the war, shell-shocked soldiers with little penny editions, railroad editions, tiny, you know, paperbacks, that Jane Austen was one of the ones that they would often really encourage these traumatized soldiers to turn to. Um, and that like someone like a Winston Churchill during the Second World War had his daughter reading him Pride and Prejudices at night. So I think it's sort of a bit of a combination of the themes of my book and the spirit in which I wrote, wrote it. And then the fact that Jane Austen is, is also known to provide comfort in and of herself. And I do think that might have helped people find this book. And I hope that they're getting comfort from it. I mean, I get wonderful messages that tell me that it is the kind of book where you can just escape into the world and take from it what you need to. And it's a bit of a fairy tale, but hopefully you figure out a few things maybe about yourself or how you want to relate to others or how you want to engage with life, especially now. And it gives a of an iconic and that's been awesome for me and I wanted to emulate that with my own text. There's a question actually from Tori just in regard to Liz's um, question about why now and she says since the beginning of COVID I've been turning to the Jane Austen mm -hmm. canon to self self-soothe. Yes. Yeah, you're yeah. onto something there. You are. No, it's do you want me to give you guys my little four points on why I think she helps us self soothe yes. yes i've been i've been asked that tori's like i've been i've been asked this a lot <laughs> so the first the first reason i think is that i'm a trained lawyer i don't practice anymore but she has highly logical prose and it's very almost musical in terms of its syntax its use of repetition its use of pause and when i listen to her in my brain from the time i was nine or ten when I read her in my mind, it was like music to my particular brain. And I think to some other people's as well. Like, I think it's one of those, you know, ways of giving information that's very calm and she uses very efficient prose. There's not a wasted word. Right. So that's one reason I think her, her use of language is very calming. Um, the other one is similar to what I was saying earlier. She it's a foreign enough world, different enough from ours that it's, we think we're escaping. But she has such a gift for quick and immediate characterization that the people are relatable. And so you see human nature in all its quirks and foibles and you inevitably see part of yourself or a neighbor or a relative. And in fact, my story about how I found, I'm probably jumping ahead here, but my story about how I found Pride and Prejudice was it was the book on the shelves I wasn't allowed to touch because it was in a box and you pull the book out of the box and 
I was like, why is the book in the box? And my mother's like, don't go near that book. So of course I had to go near it. And when I took it out, I started to read it. I was about nine and I'm reading chapter one. And Tori, you'll know this if you like Pride and Prejudice. Chapter one of Pride and Prejudice has three declaratory, like introductory paragraphs. And then bam, you're in screenplay land. You're in dialogue. And you have Mr. and Mrs. Bennett revealing everything about how they understand themselves and each other, which is extremely poorly through their choice of language and how they respond to each other. And as a child, that was like, I was like, that's my parents. I think this is everybody's parents. It's like right away I could relate to the story. And I think that relatability does help us when we're reading for comfort, like Toria commented, discover some things about ourselves. Um, and then I said I had four reasons, but I can only remember three right now. And that's the third <laughs> The third one is her happy endings, because I don't believe Jane Austen chose happy endings because she was a romantic, sentimental fool, which I am, which is the irony is that I got to have my book, you know, end the way that I do. Um, she was writing during the period of romanticism. So we have Keats dying, I think, a year after she did, you know, like we had these people that were experiencing life on this very emotional, emotive level. Jane Austen wasn't really necessarily like that, but she was writing in that time. But what she was a, an inheritor of was the marriage plot being used as a structure to resolve. And you guys, Liz and Lisa, as writers will know this, right? I mean, having the idea of an arc is what kind of gives us what we need to kind of stick at page one and stick it to all the way to page 300. So I think she was using the marriage plot as a way to resolve structurally to get her characters what she wanted them to get and to get them what they deserve because she loved her characters so much. And I think that her happy ending wasn't about being foolishly sentimental or romantic about how life really operates. I think it was both a structural choice, but also I think she loved her characters more than anyone has ever loved her characters. And I think that I'm, I'm laughing because I read the marriage plot and, um, and I, I, I'll tell you Catherine another time what I think. <laughs> so, um, Cause there's a comment about what did you think of the book, um, the marriage plot. But I think that for Jane Austen, she loved her characters so much and that comes through. And I think when we read her books, we feel good because I think you can actually feel her affection even for the rogues, you know, the Wickhams and the Willoughby's. And I think that you feel humanity in a way that you do with George Eliot, but in a very different way. And I think that all of that together gives you catharsis. And I think that it makes you feel like maybe things will work out for me and that, you know, the good guys will win. And I think that's just, sometimes you just need to feel that it's going to be okay. And that those are my personal reasons for why I turned to her for a comfort. Those are all great reasons. And I, you know, I think that's interesting what you say about her happy endings, because I think people want to simplify it, you know, happy endings so much, but I, that's really, that's interesting. Um, so if someone hasn't read any Jane Austen, where, where should they begin? Well, anyone who's watching, I'd love to know what they think. But personally, I think they should start with Pride and Prejudice because it's sort of the wittiest and freshest and most um, typical in terms of, you know, right away who your heroine is and you know who you think you know who your romantic hero might be, but the fun is that trope that were so much more popularized now, which is the hate to love romance trope. She kind of really pioneered that. So with Pride and Prejudice, you get an arc to the plot that is similar to a lot of, you know, you've got mail. Like it's similar to a lot of kind of stuff that, that we now still enjoy in terms of our more modern or popular culture. And I think that um, it's, it's just the most sort of accessible that way. Um, for people that are older, um, like me in, in midlife, there's something very beautiful about persuasion um, in terms of its themes and um, its redemption arc. Um, it's very uh, calming and it makes you realize that you can make some decisions when you're young and have regrets, but that you can always, always redirect. And I, I love those. <laughs> I'm like, somebody's quoting persuasion right now, so I'm getting highly distracted by the chat box. <laughs> persuasion, <laughs> persuasion has the like greatest love letter, I think, in all of literature. And I, I put in a small homage to that at the end of my book. I, I did a, a letter as well. Um, but in the context of her prose, you read this letter, and like this man has hardly said a word to the heroine. Um, and then suddenly in this letter, it's like, 
like I can no longer keep silent. Like I'm going to burst, you know, he's just, it's so beautiful. And oh, one last thing about Pride and Prejudice being a, a good choice for, for people first. One of the things I love about Pride and Prejudice is that Lizzie, right away I said, you know who your heroine is? So Lizzie's amazing. She's my favorite character, female character in all of literature. I think she's just so wonderful. I would love to be her, love to be her friend. And very early on in this book, Jane Austen has, who's going to be a romantic hero, diss her and like basically go, eh, she's not like, she's not hot enough for me, you know, like she's not my type, whatever. And so right away, you as the reader are even more bonded to Lizzie. Like you, you really are like really on the Lizzie side and you really are leery of Darcy. And I love how Jane Austen with Pride and Prejudice and I'm going to say Persuasion as well, she really sets it up at the beginning where she really has her heroine in a tree and like she's really throwing like sticks up at her right and like that plain writing plain writing standard of you know get the person in the tree throw a lot of sticks at them and then get them down again in act three and i really like that she really front end loads pride and prejudice and persuasion because i think that immediately gets you emotionally engaged and i think it can help people who are new to austin that level of emotional engagement can help people who are new to lost and sort of stay with the differences of a book that was written 200 years ago. I know, isn't that amazing that a book that was written, you know, that long ago, people still connect with in that, in that way. That's yeah. extraordinary. Um, the cover of your book is gorgeous. Um, can you tell us a little bit? Yeah, pull it up, girl. Show it. <laughs> oh, we got some other people showing it too. Uh, can you tell us a little bit uh, about the process and if you had any input? I, we're always curious. I think it varies from publisher to publisher. So um, I, we'd love to hear that story. <laughs> no, I, I had no input. Um, I, I didn't. I didn't know really. I'm very new to all this, so I didn't. I didn't know really how much I should say what I let, what I would want. Um, so I decided to play defense and wait and see what they kind of came up with and th then, I, then I would, you know, respond. But I did say to my agent, this is a true story. It's a historical fiction book. And with a lot of historical fiction books, they like to put the backs of people on the cover. And as a, someone who owned a bookstore, I do know that a lot of bookstore owners have said, you know, it's a lot of backs on covers and, oh, there's another one with the back on the cover. And I was sort of like sensitive to that coming from my side of the book selling side of the industry, as opposed to the design, which is a whole other skill set. And so I said to my agent, you know, hit me with it. I just don't want to have a lot like a back of a woman, you know, by a train station or like looking, you know, out over like a village or whatever. And I remember it came through and I clicked on it and there was like five backs on the book. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> and for a second, I was just sort of like looking at it. But then fortunately, this is where the design talent kicked in. Right away, I said, but they're linked. Their arms are linked. They're banded together. And they're looking kind of at the sky and at the future, at the thing that they're trying to save. And it was so thematically perfect. And then by that night, I was in love with it. So my one thing I say to a lot of debut authors is that, you know, everybody knows what they're doing. Like we're all, like it's a process, right? Everyone has different skill sets and whatever you think your book should look like, um, there's, you're the writer, right? You're not the designer. And I was really, really glad to have this cover, but it's not what I would have maybe necessarily picked and how wrong would I have been because the cover has been such a hit. And even like, you know, my, I've had men, I had a male interviewer on a radio show he loved my book and he's like, your book was a total escape. I was not expecting that. Like I, I was just reading it, you know, cause I'm going to interview you. And he said, and the cover, he said the balance and the symmetry with these beautiful, huge, almost Rembrandt-esque flowers and how that um, could even go on a poster. And I was like, oh, thank goodness. I didn't like get any input. <laughs> so. Well, yeah, I mean, you have to trust your team sometimes, but it is, it is beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Lisa, is there some, some comments? Just the one um, from Tori, the flowers are so pretty on the cover. Oh, and Amanda said, Lizzie is Adam Berwick's favorite. He's such a great character without saying too much. I was delighted for how the story arc ends. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so as I mentioned before, you're a debut author. Can you tell us um, about your journey to publication? I, I love I love hearing how people 
get from A to B. Everyone has a different path and it's so interesting. Yeah, I, I mean, I always wanted to be a writer. I think most writers, and I'm sure Catherine can back me up on this, most, most writers want to be a writer, I think, from the time they fall in love with books. It's usually pretty instantaneous. And I wanted to be a writer from the time I was able to read or even before. And I spent my teens reading a lot and dreaming about writing and writing and writing poetry, et cetera. And then I was going to go to university and my, and Catherine, you're Canadian, you'll, you understand this. So my dad's like, okay, um, what are you going to do? And I'm like, well, what I really want to do is go to the Iowa Writers Workshop. And he's like, what are you, like, what are you talking about? And like, it's 19, it's, this is like the eighties, right? And my dad's a uh, mathematician actuary in Canada. And I'm like, yeah, I want to go to Iowa and I want to go to this pro. And he's like, no. So what else are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to study English literature, but then I'll go to law school. He's like, okay, that that's parentally approved. Right. So it's, so that's what I did. And then I didn't do anything for writing for the longest time. Then when I was 30, I started to write seriously. I left the practice of law and I became a legal recruiter or headhunter and I had more time. And I wrote my first novel, I think it was around 30. And I spent, you know, the next 10 years I wrote, I haven't written as many books as you two and you guys have gotten them published, but I have like five in a drawer. And I had an Excel spreadsheet with three, 250 to 300 agents on it. And I did not know what I was doing. And I was just getting met with that huge wall of silence. And I didn't know anyone in the industry. I didn't know any writers. And I just kept flinging out there, like beating that dog dead. And, and then eventually when I turned 40, there was sort of like pressure to like, you know, contribute more of the family income and um, just spend time with another business I have as a consultant. So I was like, okay, it's not going to happen. It's not my time. And then now I am, you know, 10 years later, I write this book for myself and for my husband because I'm working through some things and I'm also wanting to stay close to Jane Austen because Tori, she'd given me this year of rereading and joy. And I, I kind of just wasn't ready to leave her, but she wrote six books and you can read them in a month. And then you're like, I need more. And so this book was a way for me to stay close to her world. And um, when I wrote this book, I said to my husband, I'm going to write again. And he's like, Oh God, Natalie. And I was like, no, it's okay. I'm okay. I'm okay. If it's just three things. So I have to enjoy every minute of writing it, which I can honestly tell you I did. I loved Aww. every minute of writing this book. And my agent knows that because whenever we had, I had, I had it at 70,000 words and I gave it to him and we got it to 90. So he, he helped me grow it by about a quarter. Um, and he's just like, he's like, you're having fun. Like I was just, I was having fun. I said to my husband, he had to love it. He is often, you guys have each other, but my husband is often my only reader. He's always my first reader and he's often my only reader. I said, you have to love it. And he did. And then I said, the third thing that had to happen was somebody outside of this house has to give an F about it. <laughs> and that was, the Jane, <laughs> that, that, that was the Jane Austen hook, right? That was the tactical, strategic, you know, there are people that care about Jane Austen that might want to read a book about people loving Jane Austen. And, you know, that kind of, I think, gave me that last final you know, impetus, but I'll never forget. Like, so I'm kind of self-taught. People will ask me, by the way, like books, to write, cause I, I won correspondence, creative writing course 22 years ago. And I would say, I was talking to my agent today, actually, we were both talking about um, The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron on writing by Stephen King. Great book by Francine Prose called um, Reading Like a Writer. And um, uh, Bird by Bird by Anne Lamott. Um, these are books that I just you know, devoured, marked up and kept, and they really taught me, you know, a lot. And then also the study of English literature as, as an undergrad, but I'll never forget when I gave my manuscript to my husband, I think the first draft was 55,000 words. Cause I build up cause I don't like killing my darling. So I don't like editing. <laughs> I, I keep it very lean the first time around. I gave it to my husband and he read it pretty fast and then he looked at me and I'll just never forget this moment. He just went, Oh no, I think you have something here. And that's what gave me to tie up the story, the final push to go, okay, going back to the Excel and I'll just, I'll send it out to a few agents who have done awesome related works in the past. And I sent it on bizarre days, July 4th and oh. Saturday. Saturday in July like I was just I did not ha was not being really into it this time because I'd been so burned you know I mean I had worked with agents I'd gotten close to some independent publishers like and it just had never happened and my agent 
I was in the middle of a piano lesson for my daughter and my agent emails me and he said, I just missed my subway stop. I read the first 50 pages. Aww. Sorry, I'm going to cry. No, I'm going to cry. He goes, I want an exclusive. And I'd never had anyone ask for that. So I was so like, oh my God, like, I can't believe it. This is that thing I've been waiting for, like for 20 years. Sorry, I've never cried on one of these. This oh, is so that's embarrassing. so sweet. Oh, I think every, everybody wants, I know when we were searching for an agent, everybody wants that subway stop story that like yeah. the agent, like, I think, um, I think like Jennifer Weiner's agent, when she first was reading Good and Bad for the first time, I feel like that was the same story. And so it was like this urban legend. So I'm happy that you got it. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah, no. And it was great because, so then he read it and then the next day he's like, okay, I want to sign you and we're going to talk. So we talked on the phone the next morning. And so I've gone in three days, I've gone from thinking like totally, this is never going to happen to, I have an agent at Curtis Brown in New York like a top agent. Right. And I was just like, and then I will never forget this. We're on the phone. And he said, you know, I get dozens of Austin related queries like a week. Like that's a lot. Right. You know, and they only, one thing I did not know, cause I was very green was that they only signed two or three writers a year. I don't know what I was thinking. Like, I, I know if I thought they like signed one a week or something, but cause they have their, their stable that they bring forward with all the consequent books, right? So I, I didn't realize that it was not that many people that get this opportunity. So now in retrospect, I understand why the numbers were the way they were, but we're on the phone and he said, I get dozens of awesome related queries a week. And I don't think I've ever had anyone do the second world war before. And it was at that moment, again, something went through me and I just remember going, oh, I think yeah, I think maybe I have hit something here commercially, like in terms of, of possibility. So, so that was, that was a really cool moment as well for me. That's awesome. If you, so based on that story, if you had one piece of advice to give to aspiring writers, what would it be? I think that's a great question. I mean, I have thought about this because people have said, oh, you're so great. You never gave up. I'm like, no, I did give up for 10 whole years. So I mean, like it does, it does happen. But I think what you have to do is you have to look at the writing, not as the end in itself. So when I was 30 and I had left the practice of law, I was like, I'm going to write a book. And then when I finished it, I was like, okay, so I wrote a book. Yay. Yay for me. So now I send it out and it'll get published. Right. Cause that's what happens. Cause not everyone writes a book there's a lot of people writing books <laughs> and there's, you know, as someone who had a bookstore, there's thousands of books coming out a week. And, you know, the bookstore was a great um, experience for me as well to show me just how many books are getting made and to understand again, how hard it is to stand out, you know, in that crowd. So when I look back, what I see was really my 10,000 hours of Malcolm Gladwell, those five manuscripts were part of developing a muscle and what I say to people is that the muse and the muscle might not meet right when you demand that they do, you know, like, okay, I have time. I'm going to write. I'm 28. I've, you know, quit my job or this has happened in life. I've got some time. Do it. But you're really exercising the muscle and the inspirations, the inspirational moments that happen to us in life. Unless you're like uh, John Grisham or Daniel, somebody who is just so prolific, you know, with the, you guys are like that too, but you know, the book that comes out, you know, that they're just able to keep generating new and interesting, imaginative, you know, ideas, but not every writer is like that. And I think that it's important to write every day, not because the end will be publication, but because you're building a muscle so that when you do have the time and or inspiration strikes, you have the mindset and the skill set to leap after it and to not waste a second. And that's what happened to me was when I finally felt like writing and I had time, I was just like, do it. And I just, you know, the expression, you know, he who hesitates is lost. It's, it's sort of like that, you know, get your ducks in a row. And the minute you have your inspiration or you have time, um, do it. And the, the rest of it shall happen when it, when it, when it will. That's great advice. I've got a question from Julie and a question from Amanda. Um, let's start with Amanda since it's about your book and your research and then we can go to Julie's. Um, Amanda's asking, did you, did you um, take travel to Chawton for research? Yes, um, I did actually. I, th this, is a, this is a long answer, but I think you guys will appreciate it being in California. So Chawton, house is the main setting of my book 
And the museum on the cover of my book that Jane Austen lived in was part of this estate that her brother had inherited and it's called the Chawton Estate. So I, for many years, go to England and go to visit the museum where Jane Austen lived, but I can't get inside Chawton House. It wasn't open to the public until 2004. And then even then it wasn't open on Mondays. And like five years in a row, my family showed up in Chawton on a Monday because we're not planners. And it was just like, we can't get in. So I became a little obsessed with getting inside Chawton House. So um, fall of 2017, we were taking a bunch of trips together as a family. And my husband decided to go golf in Augusta, Georgia. And I put up my hand and went, well, if you're going to do that, I'm going to go to England on my own and I'm going to spend a week. <laughs> And I'm going to go to Chawton House every day and the museum. And I'm going to spend the whole day there. And I'm not going to talk to anyone. And I'm going to like have tea in the afternoon. I'm going to read my Jane Austen. And, and I was doing this to kind of give myself something to like look forward to. And so I spent a whole week there. And I was, um, because I was on my own, I would be the first person to show up at the museum in the morning, the cottage. And I'd be like the last person to leave Chawton House, her brother's estate at the end of the day. And I was alone in those rooms, like the room where she wrote. And I would have so much time on my own. And I think that really helped me feel present in the moment. I think it was a big part of my inspiration. But the story I want to share with you guys is Chawton House was passed down to Jane Austen's brother's family for 200 years. And every time someone dies, there's these very punitive death taxes in England. And the family that inherits the house inherits a huge tax bill, but also the cost of maintenance. By the late 1980s, it became very difficult for the Knight family to sustain this property. So they sold it to a golf course development company, which went bust and the deal fell through. So they ended up selling Chawton House, the leased Chawton House for 120 years. They ended up selling it at auction. Meanwhile, there's an American woman, Stanford, and she head of computer um, services for, I think, the business faculty. And she, she's married to someone who's the head of computer services for a computer science department. And they're married. It's 1981. And they can't communicate at work very effectively. And they're like, we wish we could communicate better during the day. And they start to play around with routers in their living room. And they invented email and incorporated a company, a little company called Cisco. Oh, wow. Went public and sold it in 1990 for about $170 million. And they each walked away because at that point they were separated or divorced and they each walk away with half. And Sandy Lerner from California on the phone in 1991 or 1992 buys Chawton House sight unseen for 1.9 million US and spends 10 years completely restoring it to its former Elizabethan grandeur. And it is to her and to the Knight family that we owe the fact that this beautiful 400 plus year home um, still exists. And so that's just uh, one of the reasons why I have a movie star in my book is because of Kelly Clarkson. So I don't, I don't know which of you, I remember one of you looked like, I love Kelly Clarkson. So I have an I American her. movie. Okay. So I have an American movie star in my book because I wanted to pay homage to Sandy Lerner and to the fact that over time there have been very important American collectors and fans of Jane Austen that have helped save her for us. And I, I just think that I wanted to have a glo more global view of my book. You know, it's not just about being, Eng I was born in England. It's like not just about being British, right? It's about that people all over the world care about Jane Austen, have done things to support her. Kelly Clarkson bought, and this is behind my auction scene in chapter three of my book, if anyone's read it, Kelly Clarkson bought Jane Austen's turquoise ring at Sotheby's at auction. Oh, wow. 2013. Wow. She's a huge Jane Austen fan. And then the, uni the United Kingdom government put a temporary um, export order prohibiting it from leaving the country if the Jane Austen's House Museum could counterfeit, like raise, like it had been completed the transaction, but they could raise enough money. So the museum was able to raise enough money and Kelly Clarkson graciously agreed to sell the ring to them. And the ring is part of the artifacts in my book. And part of the inspiration for my stories in my book about these artifacts is those types of stories in real life. Wow. That's, I had no idea about that in Kelly Clarkson. No. I would not no. have thought of her as a, as a Jane Austen 
I guess you can't stereotype. But and I love her, American Idol. Ooh. But that's yeah. I mean, that's why with my book, I had people were like, you know, eight's a lot, eight's a lot of characters. I'm like, well, like there's there's a lot going on in here. <laughs> but at the same time, <laughs> what I wanted to do was I wanted to show the different ways in which people deal with grief. Um, because I had learned through the way I was dealing with my husband's diagnosis, the way he was dealing with it, the way, you know, our friends were dealing with it or whatever, that everyone copes differently. And I do think as a society that we do kind of think we want things to always look and feel a certain way because it makes it easier for us. It's not selfish. It's just what we know and it's what we're used to. And so with the eight characters, I wanted to explore different ways of coping with grief. Um, but I also wanted to show the different levels of fandom so from a Hollywood film star to a servant girl, um, that was important to me because historically Jane Austen has crossed outside of academia, has been somebody that people at all levels of society, regardless of their income or their education, have enjoyed. And I wanted to kind of show that in my own little way. That's awesome. Can I pop in with a question yeah, from please. Julie now? Uh, Julie, yeah. I'm so sorry that your internet's not working. I will ask it for you. She, Julie from Warwick, is wondering, have you been writing more or less than usual since the quarantine started? I'm very lucky. I've been writing the same amount. Um, I just honestly, um, my husband's disease, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, we were told four years ago that the vast majority of people will pass away within two to three years. So we're on borrowed time. Now he's stable on a bunch of drugs, but I think I must have developed some weird muscle room or bandwidth that I just got a bit of a four-year head start, I think, on a, a lot of people with the pandemic. I mean, we, we literally have not left our house in four months at all. And it's, I mean, that's hard, but at the same time, we've had to adapt to his diagnosis. So, I mean, it's, I don't want to say fortunately, but because we were already in this sort of odd state of trying to live as much in the moment and not think too much about the future, and we have had to learn to live hour by hour. We're not experts at it. We failed dramatically. We had a great morning meeting this morning. We were all having coffee. We're all laughing. There's only three of us and two dogs. We're having a great time. Yesterday morning, it was just tears. <laughs> it was just like, so we, we have our moments, but the writing muscle, I was able somehow, I think because I was able to write at this earlier difficult time that I, I have been able to. What I will say to people is that I was not able to when we were in the midst of the trauma. I was able to write when I start to feel hope again. And so what I've been saying to a lot of other authors that I'm friends with is that right now, a lot of people, most people can't create because you don't feel free. And you know how you need to feel free in your mind to creatively write. So with the situation with the pandemic, I think what's going on is that for most people, the lack of certainty and the pressure of dealing with ill parents or worrying about homeschooling, and all just it's just awful, right? It's just, it's a horrible nightmare. And I think that that prevents people from having the freedom to just sort of sit down and let it happen. And I think that that's where we have to be very kind to ourselves because what I can say is someone who has gone through these cycles and continues to go through them and who's in a little bit of a plateau, is that I had times when I couldn't, but then it came back and it will come back and it will come back. You will not be expecting it. You will not know when it's gonna happen. It will. And you could still, you could have nothing of change from the day before, but, but it will. And I'm, I'm so confident about that for all the artists in my life. And I'm, I'm very grateful that I, that I can share that with them because a lot of people in my life have been very thrown by how hard it is, um, Julie, to go back to your questions, by how hard it is, you know, to, um, to creatively write right now. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's been tough. We, we were able to finish a book, but it, it definitely, um, you know, is, is challenging, um, for sure. I, you know, I saw you say, and, and you touched on some of these, but I'd like to get into a little bit more. I saw you say in an interview that you have a lot of formers, um, can you tell us what you meant by that? You kind of touched on it, but I think it's really interesting and particularly the, the bookstore part. Yeah, no, I, um, I'm a career coach for like 20 years. That's one of my formers now, but I was career coaching up until December. And one of the other things I guess I like to talk about or have people take away when they hear my story is that I had all these different jobs and they didn't add up. One of my friends was like, he's like, we were all corporate lawyers at one of those big, you know, blue chip firms, you know, and, 
everyone's gone off to be, you know, general counsels and MDs and whatever. And he's like, he's like, watching your career, Natalie, it's like slow motion train. Like, what's going on? What are you doing? Like, you're doing this and then you're doing that. And I remember at the time, it was because when you leave the practice of law, you're, you're free falling, right? It's not like there's like, here's the job for all the former lawyers. Like, you really have to kind of take some skills and find out what you're going to do next. So what I loved about practicing law, which is one of my formers, was I loved everything about law except practicing law. I love lawyers. I love talking to them. I love talking about their careers. So then I became a recruiter. And then I became a career coach. And all I did all day long was have coffee with a stranger every day. And, you know, kind of like a version of what you guys get to do with interviewing, right? It's like wonderful, like meeting somebody and, and having that moment where you have to quickly connect and build rapport and then feel like you, maybe it was good they met you that day, that you were the person in the chair, that you helped them in some way. It's very, very rewarding. So those are some of my other formers. And then having the bookstore, like I didn't think that any of these were adding up. Having the bookstore is an experience that I think showed me how difficult the industry was to um, penetrate and how to be more patient and forgiving of myself and of my talent that just because it hadn't happened yet didn't mean that it was worthless um, that that was something that I um, have learned to kind of be uh, more understanding about the industry's prerogatives and how many books are getting published and how difficult it is and and so the bookstore was a chance for me to see what people got really excited about and Julie will know this when they come in and like so I'll never forget Curtis Sittenfeld, who's one of my friggin' Oh, I idols. love her. Yeah. yeah, I just read Rodham. I love oh, her. So I love her. So she had a book come out when I was running the store called Eligible. And it's a retelling of Pride and Prejudice. Mm -hmm. And it sort of involves like a bachelor type TV program with Bingley. And it was just really, really delightful. And the weekend it comes out, this woman runs into my store I swear she's like in her fifties. I swear she's wearing pajama bottoms under her raincoat. She has her dog and they're soaking wet and she is on her way to go to the cottage and up in Canada. We always on the weekends, lots of people are like off to the cottage. She's like on her way. Like she's like, she jumps into my store and she's like, I need that book, that book, that Pride and Prejudice book that just came out. Like I need it. Like she needed it so bad. And I just remember going, man, that Jane Austen is like really like hooked onto something here, you know? And so the bookstore was a great experience for me to connect with people over books, constantly talk about books, but also get a little insight into the kinds of things that, you know, energize them. So it's just really funny to be um, a debut author and then like to be realizing that historical fiction is very popular and increasingly popular year to year and I think when my bookstore was in operation it was the year of the nightingale and all oh. the light we and all the light we cannot see and like it was just like a re like it was just this whole like renewal like of this genre at this really high literary level and so When I am in New York or I'm on the phone with my team, I'm able to bring now to my writing career these business skill sets um, mm -hmm. that I'm so grateful that I have. But in my 20s, I'm like, oh, why am I working on this deal? Why am I working on this contract? Well, I have 15 foreign translation sales and I do all my own contract reading. And my agents are like, God, we're so glad you read your contracts. I'm like, well, I kind of like it. It's very geeky, but I, I like reading contracts because I was a contracts lawyer. So, you know, it never would have occurred to me that I could use that skill. And what I say to people as a career coach, and I always say like, they asked Michelangelo how he carved David. And he said, well, I just chipped away everything that wasn't David. And I kind of feel that that's what your career trajectory should feel like. You should feel like you tried this, you take the part of it you like the most, try and replicate that somewhere else, get a new skill. You know, and you keep doing that until you figure out what comes fastest to you, gives you the most joy, and when are you most engaged. And then you take that information, and then you look for the next thing. And then when you get to my age, in your 50s, you start looking at your career as a chance to mentor down support, right? So there's these different times to your career. And as a career coach, I've really enjoyed being able to look at my own choices, which my friend was like, what are you doing with your life? You had this job as this big lawyer, and now you're like all over the place. But it all adds up now to a skill set that's very, you know, six feet wide, you know, one foot deep, but it's, it's really laterally strong. And I love that. I love that about it. So all my formers have added up for me in, in a, a really wonderful way 
And there were times that I was worried. I did not know for sure if I was doing the right thing with my career, um, but it, it's all worked out. So That's awesome. Yeah, we, Lisa and I, that's one of our dreams to own a bookstore. Although I'm, oh. I'm sure it sounds better in um, thinking about it than actually doing it, but uh, still. Oh, no, but you know what? Like there, the thing about bookstore owners is there's so much, like there's so, there's so much information out there and bookstore owners are giving me like these one hour intensive phone calls. Like, okay, so you need to get this software and you need to sign up for this newsletter and you need to do that, right? And we got our bookstore up and running in three weeks. So we did not, we did not waste a lot of time on rent and we're used to a jewelry store space. But what I would say to people is that it's not a profit center, right? It's, it's not, but you, you don't, you're not going to lose money if you do it the right way. But the joy of talking about books and talking to people about books all day long, there was like nothing better than that. It's, I, it's also, I will say this, um, that having my own bookstore was, the hardest job I ever had, but the most rewarding, you know? So it's one of those jobs where you're not sitting back reading, like waiting for someone to come through the door. Like you're always have something to do, but it's magical. It's like the best of commerce. It's wonderful. That's awesome. Oh, sorry. Sorry. There you go. I'm, okay. I'm my, uh, Liz likes to mute me, so I don't. You had gar you had garbage trucks. I know I had so some I garbage truck it. stuff happening. Um, I was just saying I was jealous, and then I wanted to um, read some of the questions, if that's okay. Yeah, Liz. girl, go for it. I'm breaking. Okay. Um, Christine is asking, other than Jane Austen, who inspires you in your writing? Um. I was an English literature student, Christine, so I um, really loved the classics. I'll start with the older folks. So I think um, the Brontes, George Eliot, Henry James, Ian e. Forster, Virginia Woolf. I love what I call my guys. So F. Scott Fitzgerald, Hemingway, and John Steinbeck. I really love them. Um, I do love Salinger and Nabokov. And then when I get to modern times, I love Elizabeth Strout. I love Eleanor Lippmann. I love Ian McEwen, Kazuo Ishiguro, um, Laurie Cohen, the late Laurie Cohen. Um, oh gosh, Susan Minot. There's um, a bunch of modern American writers in particular that inspire me because they're, they're genius um, at distilling the things I'm interested in, sort of how we relate to each other and our social exteriors and, and our internal worlds. And I, I think that um, there's just a bunch of them that inspire me to want to probe in a, a psychologically realistic way. I aspire to, it's nowhere near theirs, but these are the writers that help me stay true to what I want to explore with my prose, which is not courtroom dramas or you know um, thrillers or whatever. It's very much a quiet, interior exploration of what makes people tick and how people can connect um, and how we can actually also barrier each other. And I, and I love these writers. They inspire me that way to kind of keep exploring that terrain. Glass, and we'll be starting that in about 10 minutes. Right now we're talking to Natalie Jenner. Um, and I think we have, uh, I thought I think we have another question here. Oh, yep. Yeah. yeah, we do. I was just waiting on you to do your housekeeping. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Amanda Q is asking, what is your favorite, okay, maybe top three Austin adaptation, whether they are movies or other books? And then Catherine McKenzie just jumped in and said, BBC Pride and Prejudice is the best ever adaptation bar none. So yeah. hopefully you agree with that one. I was doing another event, Catherine and the bookstore, the bookstore owner asked the same question. I was like, there's no way to win and answer this question, right? So I'm glad I'm asked for three because I can do three. So definitely the 1995 Colin Firth um, Pride and Prejudice. I also love the Ang Lee Sense of Sensibility with Emma Thompson um, and Hugh Grant. I think that's actually one of my all-time favorite movies. I just, my daughter and I just watched it on the weekend. Every time we watch it, we're just blown away 
um, by what Ang Lee was able to do with that movie. And I also, I'm a bit of an outlier. I really like a very old 1980 version of Pride and Prejudice because that's where I was 12 and got the hormonal rush with Mr. Darcy. So that's a special <laughs> kind of memory, you know, as a girl. Um, but I also really loved the new Emma um, by Autumn DeWilde that came out this year. And the Persuasion with Karen Hines um, from about the mid 90s. And also a Canadian film director, Patricia Razima, made a very, I thought, interesting production, a movie of Mansfield Park with Harold Pinter, Johnny Lee Miller, Mrs. O'Connor, which is actually a very rich book and it's a, it's a very rich adaption. It's a very, it's a very, she's really pushing the envelope on that one, but I thought it was very brave and very daring. So those are my favorites, more than three, but yeah. Hey, that's okay. Um, so we just have a few more minutes here, so I'm trying to decide what I want to ask Well, there's you. some um, comments, more comments okay. on adaptations if you want me to- Yeah, girl, go. Read, read go. those. Um, so just responding to what you're saying. Amanda, BBC is pretty darn good, yes, but the Sense and Sensibility movie with Emma Thompson, Hugh Grant is pretty great. Heck yes, yes. And then <laughs> Catherine says, Sense and Sensibility was okay. There's a couple of good persuasions, both BBC ones. Getting BBC vibe from Catherine. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. And then Tori saying, me too, the new Emma is fantastic. And then Catherine again, a good BBC Mansfield Park was done with Felicity from Star Wars. Nice. Yes. Is, um, and, um, or was that the Northanger Abbey? trying to remember is she oh, saying well, yeah you're right yeah, 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 I had, yeah i'm unmuting you catherine yeah no that 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 was a that was a really good with jj field you're right, right. That was it, was, it was north anger abbey you're right you're right yeah no, that's a really good that was a really good idea uh, it was sure. yeah yeah no and uh, in my book i had a couple of moments where i was channeling like these different you know productions because i, I love film and i wanted um I think I had a Hollywood film star in there because I wanted in my book to kind of just in a fun lighted way, lighthearted way, talk about a really vacuous, moronic Hollywood producer who knows nothing, Jack Leonard, who I love in my book, um, ad adapting sense of sensibility and just becoming increasingly enamored by the rogue in the book. Like, so he just wants more Willoughby. Let's have more. Lee's production of Sense and Sensibility versus the later one that Andrew Davies did the screenplay for, where it immediately starts off with a scene that's not in the book with Willoughby as seduced an underage girl and is riding away on horseback from her little house. And it was just this different approach, you know? And I remember having fun with that. And I also did an homage to Ang Lee's Sense and Sensibility at the end of the book when I have a character breakdown. Um, I was just channeling that moment. And I'll never forget, Emma Thompson was on the Oprah Winfrey show and Oprah Winfrey said to her, she said, that moment, at the end of your screenplay, for which Emma Thompson won the Oscar, she said, that moment where you break down in front of Hugh Grant and just start sobbing uncontrollably is like one of Oprah's like all-time favorite movie moments, right? Because it's this ultimate release um, of a character that could not have been more, you know, repressed or, or holding in her emotions. So I had a variant of that in my book because I always love that moment. It gets me every time, so. That's awesome. Um, I feel like this is a, a good, and I'm curious what your answer is uh, to end on, and then I'm going to ask you about where to find you online. Mm -hmm. But what is your favorite Austin quote? And I'm sure a lot of people in here will probably have an opinion about, about it too. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's from Sense and Sensibility, and I'm not going to get it right because I have the worst memory for quotes. It's really embarrassing. But it's know your own happiness call it patience or give it another name, hope. It's something to that extent. And I think what she's really getting to there is something that I've had to really learn in my own middle age, which is um, to be more patient with the different um, things that happen to us in life and to, be, to know what really makes you happy and to keep always aiming for that. What makes you happy? Not what other people are telling you your life should look like. Um, but also in not calling it patience, but calling it hope. 
And thinking of hope as a variant of patience is why I love that line, because what she's saying is, is that um, hope is a form of patience. It's knowing that, you know, this too shall pass. And there will be things that we will take from this that will, we will be glad we got and the pain will be replaced by other experiences and it will happen again, like the cycle. But I love, I love that concept of hope and patience being a version of the same thing. So that's my favorite quote. But I got it wrong. Like, I know I quoted it wrong. And See what, though? You got the, like, I understand what you're saying. Like, and I think that's a beautiful, um, it's a beautiful quote. Uh, Catherine saying, happiness in marriage is an enti entirely a matter of chance. That's yes. your favorite quote, <laughs> Catherine? <laughs> Uh, well, it's been so uh, delightful talking to you today. Can you tell everybody where they can find you online? Sure. I have a website and it's my name.com. So nataliejenner.com. And I have um, a resources page there, the Spotify playlist. And um, a lot of my interviews are uploaded there. Um, and pretty much, yeah, anything you'd need to know about me can be found there. And I have a contact form there too, if you want to message me. That's great. Um, and you guys, you can find us at Instagram, Lisa and Liz, or uh, Facebook, Liz Fenton and Lisa Steinke. And um, in about three minutes, I'll be, I've got some people in the waiting room. I, I'm going to let them in and we'll start with But Julie, I want to pass it to you. Okay. I had yeah. to move. I think I got, I think my signal's better. So if I'm like, yeah. In the dark, but now I'm in the dark, so I have to like readjust my lighting. So Natalie, that was fantastic. Thank you so much for being with us. And we're so happy for all of the success with the book. And um, like you said, people coming in the store and grabbing it. And hopefully in these days, they're ordering it from us um, online too. So yeah. since going into stores is a little tricky these days. Um, anyways, that was a fantastic. Again, if you want to order it, call us or um, order it online. And anyways, that was a great interview, Liz and Lisa. Thank you. Thank you. And thank Natalie, you. thank you. And I'm going to go ahead and let everybody in for the next one. And I hope that you guys will stay with us. Thank you so much, Lisa and Liz. Yeah, thank thanks. Wishing you a ton of success. Thank you. And good luck with your book, too. Thank you. Okay, bye. All right, everybody that's coming in. Um, we're just finishing up with Natalie Jenner, and we're really excited to start with Serafina in a few minutes. Serafina, I know you're in here. I just let you in. I'm going to come and unmute you in just a second. Um, let me see here. I'm going to find you. Okay. I see her here. Ah, there she is. Okay. Hi, Hi. Serafina. Hi, can you hear me? I can. Yeah. Hi. We're just rolling over from uh, the talk we just have. We'll give it a few more minutes. I'm still okay. letting people in. Um, but you know what? I'm in here. I'll go over the housekeeping for the new people. Um, so there's two different ways to watch. You can watch in gallery or speaker view. You can adjust that in the top right hand corner of your laptop or left hand corner of your iPad. Um, so Gallery views like Hollywood Squares, speaker view, you know, wherever the speaker's speaking, you'll have that person in your screen. Um, and then we have a ton of ways for you guys to participate. We love hearing from you. We love your questions. So if you scroll down to the bottom, um, you'll see a chat icon. So if you click on that icon, that's where you can ask us questions. You can ask to be unmuted, to ask a question yourself. That's where we'll put links to Serafina's book or any other books that we mention. And um, give it about one more minute and then Julie, I will I will pass it uh, to you. I'm still letting a few people in. But that was yeah, fun should, with Natalie. Yeah, yeah that was yeah. good. Yeah, let's wait to get to the top of the hour because um, yeah, we'll absolutely. probably have some, yep. some people absolutely. coming. Hi, Serafina, welcome. Thank you. I usually have my Warwick sign, but I've had some, um, I'll put it over when I go, when I drop out. I've had some like technical difficulties today. <laughs> you sound great now. You sound great now. And you yeah, everything's you better. Is that good lighting? I have, a, oh, that's the light you guys told me to get. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. Like, oh my God. I've been moving things in the background while in that last one. So it's like, holy cow. <laughs> yeah. They're behind the scenes, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> 
The waiting room like, will be more dramatic than the actual interview. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, well, I don't right. think so. <laughs> no way. But no we've been way. we've been doing these. Gosh, Liz and Lisa, how many of these have we done? A lot. A lot. Enough where we realize we need ring lights. <laughs> 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 how did we go so long i mean I not to say that it's made any difference for me but well um, yeah, at least i feel better you look fantastic Died. <laughs> um yeah i know it wasn't we we hadn't been using ring lights and then we did an event with uh, jen lancaster for our own book launch and she looked amazing and we looked like we were pasty face sitting in the dark and we realized yeah like ring light and we were like oh we've done like a thousand of these events without them so although I have to make sure I don't lift my because I hate seeing it in my glasses that drives me crazy uh, oh yeah I can't see it right now okay good <laughs> all right well we're uh, at the top of the hour so why don't we go ahead and uh, get started um, so I'm just letting a few more people in I can do that too if you want, Liz, while I'm... Yeah, great. That'd be great. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, welcome everyone. Um, and thank you for those of you that are staying for the second hour. My name is Liz Fenton and I'm here with Liz at least. <laughs> Give me my name. <laughs> it's been a long day. I'm here with Lisa Stanky, who is my uh, best friend of over 30 years and co-author of seven novels. Our most recent novel came out two weeks ago today. Uh, it's called How to Save a Life, and it's a dark, heart-pounding love story with a Groundhog Day twist. And guess what? It's available at Warwick's, right, Julie? <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, it is. So I actually have signed copies. So I'm going to put that in the link um, in the chat comment. And Serafina, welcome to Warwick's. It's so wonderful having you here for our couch surfing book tour. So um, just wanted to welcome you. Um, I'll put Serafina's book in the chat too so that you can just easily click to it. Um, basically what I like to say is thank you all for coming and for listening. Um, a couple things that I'm gonna say. If you've been to these before, sorry for repeating, but this is an unprecedented time for authors to be releasing books. So of course we would appreciate you purchasing the book from Warwick's, but any way that you can support authors and buying their books, they appreciate it. We appreciate it. So um, I know it's tough times, but we love bringing you this content and we love supporting these authors. So um, basically Warwick's, for those of you that don't know, we're located in San Diego, um, La Jolla, California. Um, we are open for business. So if you're in the San Diego area, you can come and shop with us, social distancing and masks. Um, but anyway, you can get a book, you can get it from Warwick's. If you order it online, we'll ship it to you. Call us at the store. You can pick it up at the store. We'll mail it to you. Or if you live in La Jolla, we'll drive it to your house. So That's <laughs> we will, service, girl. That's we, will service. Get, we will get you that book. So anyways, with that, thank you for giving me a couple minutes and you guys have a great conversation. Thank well, you. welcome, Serafina, and congratulations on your book. I'm going to tell everyone a little bit about you and then we'll, I'll put